straighten up a bit here. Aww, he's so cute. Hey, everybody. Um, oh, we're, we were recording that whole time. Of course, we were recording that whole time because right. he's so cute. We love you, Sergio. His feet stick up. Yeah, we thought we'd give you some some fun, some sweet, some nice because we're actually uh, talking about something very sad. Uh, mm. We're we're talking about uh, the the passing of the late great Toby Hooper, the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Poltergeist, Life Force, mm. Eaten Alive, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which is almost as good as the original, if you ask me. Uh, in, in a very different way. Totally different movie, <laughs> but also excellent. Um, um, he, he's, he, he, he gave yeah. you every nightmare you've ever had, essentially. A lot of them. Yeah. A lot of them. Yeah, he's he's considered one of the so-called masters of horror, uh, a group that was kind of officially codified by that uh, Showtime mm. anthology series, Masters of Horror, which was spotty like most anthologies. Uh, but even that's relatively appropriate because all of the so-called masters of horror have some some gaps in their career. They're, they made masterpieces, mm. and then they've also made stuff like Deadly Friend or the remake of Village of the Damned <laughs> or, or Bruiser. And Toby Bruiser's. Hooper had some real highlights and some yeah. also some lowlights. And, and it, it's kind of rough because we just recently also lost George Romero. So yeah. we're just sort of facing down the fact that this generation mm -hmm. of uh, genre horror filmmakers who... And, you know, we lost Wes Craven a couple years back. Yeah. So like, just this whole generation is just kind of passing away from us. And we have to really kind of stop and appreciate what, what they've done. Yeah. As, as if we ever stopped. Well, I think um, we have in some ways. Because I think a lot of those, as I was saying, a lot of those incredible filmmakers, a lot of people who gave us the scariest movies ever made, particularly starting in the 1970s and 80s, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them had trouble finding really good work mm -hmm. as time went on. That's, you, that's his phone, that's not That's my yours. phone this time. Uh, but, uh, you know, and as a result, you know, towards the end of Wes Craven's career, when he made something like Soul Survivors, which, as my understanding, wasn't very good. I didn't not see not it. Soul Survivors, you're thinking of My Soul to Take. Apollo. Apologies, Soul yes. Survivors was a different movie. But Apologies, yeah. yes. My soul to take. <laughs> uh, which, you know, a lot of people were just like, oh, Wes Craven, will, uh, he makes such crap now. I'm like, yeah, but look at the whole career. Mm. Absolutely astounding. And Toby Hooper is another one of those. Um, he had made uh, some documentaries, short films, uh, before he did Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but then he made Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is one of the original low-budget, independent, run-and-gun, mm. whole bunch of people going insane, working overtime in a house, actually cutting each other in order to get the shot, because damn it, we just can't get the shot. <laughs> Madness of a movie, using real human bones, that's true. We used actual human bones for some of those bones in the, uh, in the Sawyer house, the original Texas Chainsaw, because it was cheaper to get them. It's oh good. Yeah, it's insane, but it what? made one of the best horror movies ever, arguably the best. I would actually put it right up there. It's 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 definitely one of the best of all horror yeah. movies, and it's difficult to see where something like that came from. Mm -hmm. It is so raw. It is yeah. so visceral. You know, it, it's been said that it's like watching a snuff film. Yeah. And it it and a, a, a friend of mine, uh, Mark Hoykes, put it this way: like it's so grimy, the actual look of the film, and this is probably deliberate. Mm -hmm. it, it's so, it kind, it's kind of washed out. The film looks kind of faded. It's probably because they couldn't afford very good film stock. Oh no, that that and movie was shot on like sixteen millimeter and blown yeah, up to thirty five. So like it was super cheap. It, it looks like it's been sitting in a slaughterhouse next to pig heads for like yeah. several years before it was projected, and. The immediacy of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind of changed the way horror could be made. Yeah. Before this, we did have gore flicks before this, thanks mm -hmm. to Herschel Gordon Lewis. We also had independent uh, flicks, yeah. thanks to Herschel Gordon Lewis mm -hmm. and the likes of Night of the Living Dead or The Island of the Lost Souls. That had been done. Mm -hmm. That was not new. Well, I, I, but, Island of the Lost Souls was a studio picture. But, no, uh, I'm sorry, did I say Island of the Lost Souls? What did I, what did I mean there? Oh, uh, Carnival of Carnival Souls. Carnival of Souls, okay. Carnival of Souls. But that, you know, they had... That, that had the dam had been cracked, mm. but just being able to get a whole bunch of people on a truck and make a, a, a violent nightmare mm. of a movie. You, you listen to any horror filmmaker who emerged in the wake <laughs> of Texas Chainsaw, and they will tell you one of the films they studied was Texas Chainsaw. Sam Raimi, hell, Ridley Scott said Texas Chainsaw was a huge influence on Alien. Well, and and uh, it, it was one of those things that you know it's. It's dirty and it's horrible and it played grindhouses. It played drive-ins. Mm -hmm. It's you know people are getting high and watching this. People are mm -hmm. making out to this sort of thing. It's being h spoken about in hushed tones, but just sort of amongst the underground crowd. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was cracking through into a lot of mainstream criticism. Yeah, and people like Roger Ebert, you know, who is still you know kind of I guess he was 
had to his career. Se- several years uh, yeah. at this point, but he was starting to say there is kind of a visceral immediacy to a movie like this that we really shouldn't be ignoring. And Roger it's Ebert dis- was kind of notoriously anti-horror for a yeah. lot of his career. He did not, even some of the better horror movies, he just didn't get them. At all. It oh, wasn't but, his thing. But, you know, occasionally... So though, he loved this. Occasionally, he though, he came admitted forward. He, yeah. he admitted that... I don't think he loved it, but he mm. did say that something new was being done. Fair enough. He did love Halloween. He actually yeah. helped bring that into to, to light. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, something about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre well, was sort of cracked open horror... To, to a new level, to an end, to a new generation. Well, I think, what you and all of a sudden, in the wake of it, you saw all of these incredibly violent, really, really raw, uh, kind of well, underground I, films coming. I think out. the one-two punch of Texas Chainsaw and um, Wes Craven's Last House on the Left, what both yeah, of those movies yeah. did, a they were extraordinarily violent, but Last House on the Left even more so than Texas Chainsaw. But because uh, Texas Chainsaw actually leaves a lot off camera, like it's mm. it's still super violent, but like it's not as gory as you might think compared to some of the other films in the series. Um, but they both had a really documentary, realistic aesthetic. Yeah, they were because they were shot so cheaply, because they were shot by people who were not only making documentaries but were inundated with footage of stuff like the Vietnam War and uh, the 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 hippie movement. There were so many documentaries. In fact. Uh, um, Toby Hooper made a documentary about Peter, Paul, and Mary. So he's very familiar with that whole bunch of hippies on a bus talking about horoscopes and shit. And as a result, <laughs> the the first chunk of Texas Chainsaw Massacre... It's just a bunch of people on a bus. Just a bunch of people on a bus and they pick up a weird guy. Like, actually, not a lot is happening in it. But we know it's called the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We have that great opening narration by John Larroquette. Um, and it's it's... It's who, believable. We believe back, that all of those things happen. John Larroquette, who came back for the remake, by the yeah. way. Yeah. That, that, that was... I thought... The remake was misguided from beginning to well, end, but uh, I, I think it was kind of cute that they got John Larroquette. What I think is fascinating totally about the remake, the remake, a lot of people really, really like the remake, and I, under, I think I understand mm-hmm. why. I think I see what it hits. Because the remake is a different kind of scary. The remake is actually, I think, abusive to its audience. I think you, the movie Pretty is like so. I well, think so. I think that's I think that's the idea. I think it is angry at you and it is trying to make you it, the movie that movie makes you live with the Sawyers the entire yeah. time. Okay. And and as a result it feels very punishing and people that makes people uncomfortable and as a result that that is scary but it's a very different kind of scary and I, I think it's a cheaper kind of scary. Well, keep in mind that both the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and its remake came out in kind of dire war t- wartime yeah. for America. Good we had the point. Vietnam War and we had the George W. Bush era or just war all the yeah. wall to wall well, still so, in that and, and yeah still in those wars and uh, so America was really sort of looking to like with the remake it's especially obvious that we were trying to break out of escapism and back into something more serious the problem mm. is the remake was so glossy that it was kind of at odds with itself it's too pretty for its own good yeah, like it's, yeah. and it's the same DP Strangely, it's really weird. Well, he, yeah. he had developed and grown. Oh, over I know. I just think it's decades, really interesting. But yeah, uh, it's yeah. the original has none of that gloss. In fact, it very deliberately strips all. I think of it's the Daniel gloss Pearl, off. right? Who did you John both? I think that's. I think yeah, that's correct. I think that's correct. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Toby Ho- Toby Hooper broke onto the scene with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and proved that he was a guy with a lot of weird ideas and continued mm. to make move a lot of really weird movies. This is the thing that's amazing uh, about Toby Hooper is that seriously, most of his movies are super fucking weird. And the ones that people remember, the two that people remember the best, Mm -hmm. Texas Chainsaw and Poltergeist, are the ones that are, in a lot of ways, his most grounded. They're They're they're, really grounded films. They're very accessible. I've heard uh, since his death, I read a couple articles, that while he's the credited director on Poltergeist, that Spielberg actually did most of the heavy lifting. I mean, Spielberg's fingerprints are all over Poltergeist. Spielberg, here's the deal. Poltergeist and E.T. were in production at more or less the same time. Spielberg couldn't do both. In fact, I think they came out within the same month. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and as a result, Spielberg couldn't do the heavy lifting. And so he wanted to do Poltergeist, but Toby Hooper ended up doing Poltergeist, but Spielberg was on set all the time. And there are conflicting reports as to how much of an input mm. Spielberg had. Some people say Spielberg just flat out directed it. Some people say Spielberg contributed to the aesthetic with all the really scary stuff, mm. the guy pulling off his face and stuff, that that was Toby Hooper. The, that the I'm willing to buy that because I'm I don't think you bring the... in Toby Hooper and then and then not give him any input. Yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. it's sort of like an AI kind of thing where Spielberg is trying to mash his style in with someone else's, mm-hmm. and I think it's a more organic 
uh, uh, mix than AI turned out to be. The notion of like, there's this scene where in oh, Poltergeist where people throw a rope like into another dimension uh-huh. and it comes out in another part of a house. Yeah. That seems like a very Toby Hooper idea to me. Mm. Uh, the, the stake that crawls across the tabletop very the Toby guy Hooper. pulling his face off. Yeah. Those are the all clown. Toby, you the know, clown. The, these, these seem like Toby Hooper ideas. But the first like third of that movie which is mostly the family dynamic, that, that, that drama. That could be E.T. And the sense of wonder like that, emo- that moment at the beginning where the mom and the little girl realize that their house is haunted and they think it's neat. Mm. And like, hey, look, let me show you. And then just the ghost scoots the girl across the kitchen Mm. and Craig T. Nelson is flabbergasted but he has to admit it's kind of wonderful and expands their (laughs) consciousness and then the horror strikes. Uh, Poltergeist and... I'm going to tell a story which is true for myself and probably for a whole generation of kids. I know what you're going to say. uh, I was eight. It's uh, which is too early in age to see Poltergeist, which is how most people saw it because it was um, marketed as a family friendly film, and it's only rated PG. This was back when there was no uh, PG thirteen; it only yeah. went G, PG, R, and because of films like Poltergeist and, and, and there Gremlins, was X then but we it was. It was, basically, it was basically Spielberg's fault. There was Poltergeist, Gremlins, and Temple of Doom. Because of those movies, everyone's like, okay, we need PG-13. This we is need it's good. something a little harder. Yeah, it's just something, like, just tell you, like, but, don't bring your five-year-old, it'll yeah. mess him up. Uh, but when I was eight, I was very interested in horror movies, but I was too scared to watch them, mm. because I'm eight years old. Yeah. And, you know, so I'd catch glimpses of them. I'd pick up the box, the video boxes at my local video store and, like, mm. tantalize myself, give myself nightmares. And I decided to finally just knuckle under see my first horror movie and I chose Poltergeist. Yeah. It seems like it might be kind of easy. Oh, goodness, no. No. This is a, a movie where people do pull their faces off and it, there's monsters and killer trees and people covered in glop. And I'm not sure what my first serious and, horror movie was. Yeah, it, it, it did give I've, me nightmares for months. I've seen a bunch of the universal horror movies. I think mm. my first like serious, hardcore, genuinely scary like movie that's supposed to give you nightmares, like it's James Bond against skin. I think the first one I saw was A Night Loving Dead. Okay. That worked. That movie was scary <laughs> as hell. I mean, it really it's was still effective. scary too. Yeah. So, a Poltergeist, I consider I consider Texas Chainsaw and Poltergeist to be in the upper echelon, top ten, maybe even top five best and scariest horror movies ever made. Mm-hmm. I think that's you can't take that away from Toby Hooper. But we got to talk about some of the other films on his film grade because they're fucking weird. Have you ever seen <laughs> Eden Alive? I haven't seen Eden Alive. Eden Alive is fucking weird. It was his follow-up to Texas Chainsaw. It took him several years to actually direct a follow-up to Chainsaw. And he ended up making this movie about a guy who runs a motel in the bayou, and then he keeps feeding people to his pet alligator, and that's it. That's the whole fucking movie. It it plays like this really weird, kind of southern gothic, really messed up, low-budget skeevy church production of a Tennessee Williams play, but with murder and alligators. It's got... um, Oh, God, what's the name of the guy? Uh, he was a fan of the Paradise. Oh, that guy. Uh, yes, that guy. I, I don't remember. William Finley. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's in it. Uh, he's great. Uh, Morticia Adams is in it as, like, this weird Southern Gothic madam who, like, <laughs> accidentally sends one of her prostitutes to get eaten by an alligator. That is the, the actress who played Morticia yes, Adams. Yes, so. I, I can't remember her name offhand. I apologize. I'm more of a movie guy often. But, uh, yeah, it's... It's gross, and it's uncomfortable, and I honestly can't even say I recommend it. It's kind of weirdly oppressive. Um, Another film of his that everyone really talks about a lot is Life Force, which is a bizarre movie. Life Force is uh, like a British co-production, so Mm -hmm. it has a British cast, including Mm -hmm. some really impressive actors like Patrick Stewart's in there. And it's got a a real classy vibe to it. Mm -hmm. Some people consider it kind of an unofficial remake of Quatermass in the Pit. But it's got this basically British scientists find out aliens are invading, mm-hmm. and it's space vampires, because it's actually based on a novel called The Space Vampires. And uh, the most notable thing, and of course the, the thing many people re- remember about Life Force is Matilda May, yeah. uh, the young actress who played the space vampire. She was discovered nude in a coffin and spends her entire a screen space time. Coffin. A space coffin. Astronauts find a space coffin. They bring it back they to they bring it back to Earth because it has a nude Matilda May inside because she's a gorgeous and nude. You don't just want just... to leave that lying around. You want to nope. take that home. <laughs> if you found one, yeah, please return. To, Out of respect, uh, Matilda May spends her entire. All of her screen time, essentially, completely in the buff. Uh, it, which really isn't that much screen time. A lot of it is just British people talking. Life Force is kind well, of it's, amazing it's Brit- because it's... it's a lot of like really slow scenes of British people talking. Yeah. And then like a rubber mummy will spring to life and suck electricity out of somebody's yeah. face. Yeah, and it's insane and for then, about a minute. And then there's 15 minutes of just yeah. talking again. It's, it's a bizarre <laughs> movie. This is part of a three-picture deal Toby Hooper did with the Canon Group, who made a lot of the most mm. surreal motion pictures you of the 1980s. Right I do, actually. I was just rewatching it today. Yeah. 
his life force. Um, but uh, yeah, this was a twenty-five million dollar R-rated, ultra-violent, nudity-infested sci-fi movie. It cost twenty-five million dollars in the mid nineteen eighties. To put that in context, Aliens cost sixteen million. So, big budget production. For, especially for Canon Group. They yeah. threw money at this sucker. A lot of people really love that one. I think it's a little slowly paced for my taste, but if any of that sounds cool, you owe it to yourself to at least check it out. Well, it's it's just so it's so weird. It's so weirdly paced. Yeah. And the where it goes, you just it's not something you can predict. No. It's intriguing. And I think that's something that can be said about all of Toby Hooper's sort of tr- the ones that are true to his spirit mm-hmm. because when he's really kind of off on his own in, off in his own little world especially when he had some money behind him that's where we get the real kind of strange Toby Hooper we get yeah. Life Force out of there we get Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 out of there. which that. is fucking insane <laughs> it's, it's just crazy. oh my god like if the, you haven't seen Texas Chainsaw it's 2 like the murder family now lives in this like vast underground labyrinth of some sort yeah it's like underneath like an amusement park no. but then like at some point and it's full of bodies like they've been killing thousands of people like it, there's no fucking way like it's all like the plausibility of the first film fucking gone but Toby Hooper kind of owns that and he transforms it into this totally just baffling descent into madness you got Dennis Hopper dual wielding chainsaws you know <laughs> fighting off the, the remnants of the Sawyer family who are now participating in and winning chili cook-offs with their human meat chili um, you've got the great Caroline Williams as oh what's the DJ's name again I forgot the DJ's name she's ah. just the, the coolest DJ in the world she's, she's one of my she's favorite like horror a, protagonists she's got you know this really awesome haircut and she dresses well and has the cowboy boots mm-hmm. and she's a DJ so she's just really awesome and she yeah. seems really laid back and cool and she's kidnapped by a murder family well, where she actually is pursuing think... the murder family too because mm-hmm. someone calls into her uh, show and she ends up like recording live on the air like a, the, a murder from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre family and then she actually is like trying to find these people and she's actually putting herself out there and they need to take her out in order to keep their secrets mm-hmm. um, she'll, she'll end up being tied up in a basement oh, next, next to Leatherface that's I right but she, like, I don't think she's a helpless victim though she's she's got a certain no, amount of but, like uh, she, she's a heroine I think she's really uh, uh, pushing the story forward the whole time but at the same time you do get to see just how the horror of this murder family just kind of undoes her after a while. Oh yeah, she goes completely um, nuts, yeah. Dennis Hopper doesn't know how to use a chainsaw. <laughs> oh my god, there's this great bit of just him like test driving chainsaws and you can yeah. see that he just doesn't get the he does, premise. He doesn't know how to hold them. He thinks yeah. they're, they're used like axes and he's seen chopping a tree with a, like with a running chain. It's like that's that's not how it works. It, it runs. Or it's a chain. You can well, he's only going to use it on human flesh. So, like, what's he's not really. He doesn't really need to know the he's, right he's way. He's like dive in and pull back. So yeah. he still has it, I guess. Yeah. But Texas Chainsaw, like that was a movie that I think a lot of people were really not happy with when it came out because much like like something like Halloween three, it was so dramatically different from what they expected. But it, I think over time, people have come to appreciate that. That's the other good one. <laughs> like, there's Texas Chainsaw. Uh-huh. There's Texas Chainsaw 2, which is a totally different entity, but totally great. I see why people like the remake, and then the rest of them suck. A lot. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Had a little uh, battery oh, thing there. Yeah. Sorry. Um, running out of batteries. Running dude. out of batteries, man. It's all super weird. Well, uh, other... That was just me booping you in the nose. Hello. Boop. Uh... Other notable Toby Hooper movies. He did yeah. a f- movie called The Fun House, which was yeah. a little bit more of a conventional horror movie. That movie is the slowest build of like any horror movie. Yeah. Like, it, 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 it like, there's a, like two thirds a, of the movie, nothing happens. It has a pretty terrific climax, but mostly yeah. it's people sort of like waiting to encounter the albino freak that lives in the fun house. Yeah, there's there's um, a there's a guy in a monster mask who works at a fun house and he's uh his father like is the carnival barker and like five other people and they never really talk about it. And then they witness this monstrosity guy like murder someone and of course they have to kill these kids in order to keep their secret. The last half hour is great, but yeah, it's a bit of a slog to get to that last half hour. I was a fan of, when I was a kid, his remake of Invaders from Mars, which is nowhere near as good as the original Invaders from Mars. The original Invaders from Mars is brilliant, and it's one of the best sci-fi think, horror films ever made. I think Stan Winston is really the star of the remake of it Invaders kind, from Mars. Yeah, kind of is. The, the guy, he created all of the creatures, he did all of the special effects. They're this 
bulbous, weird yeah, creations. Like just his, potato his, monsters with olive cannons. They, they essentially, like, they're, they're like Pac-Man, essentially. They're just yeah. giant heads with giant mouths and tiny little itty-bitty yeah, spindly and, arms. And, and spiky you know. teeth that are like this big. And then the, so, the, the head of the, mon- the yeah. Martians is this like tentacle with a face on the yeah. end of it. And it, it, it basically is a straight-up remake of the original mm-hmm. with a totally different monster aesthetic. Um, if you've Whichever one you see first, I think it's going to really impress you. But it, whenever you see this, the, the original, I think you're going to realize just yeah, how it, ahead of its time that yeah. movie was. T- Toby, so I don't think Toby Hooper was bringing much uh, in terms of like tone or story to this remake. Uh, but he was yeah. bringing a hell of a lot of style. Yeah, and, and I loved and it when just, I was a kid. And it's just really fun to watch just because yeah. it looks so great. Uh, um, after oh, Invaders we, from Mars... We, we skipped a big one. We skipped uh, Salem's Lot. I don't like Salem's Lot. I love... <laughs> I, Salem's Lot's another one where I love where it goes. Okay. Uh, so he did the television miniseries version of Salem's Lot. The original one, not the Rob Lowe one that nobody ever talks about. <laughs> uh, and I wasn't there for it, but to hear everyone else say like what it was like to have Salem's Lot on TV at the time, it was like there was nothing that scary on television, mm-hmm. supposedly. And I think it really struck people. But you watch it now, and it's another one where... It's got a good cast. It's got like, James Mason and stuff, but like... It's just basically Stephen King town, small town melodrama. But what I do like what that movie does is the town very slowly deteriorates into being overrun with vampires to the extent that by the time it really is completely overrun with vampires, you'd be hard-pressed to pinpoint exactly when it happened. And I think that's very effective. I think there's a shorter version of it. I feel like it feels padded for television. Yeah. Like a Toby Hooper could cut that down maybe by about half an hour you'd have like a really great vampire movie, but... Well, eh. It's it's also super cheap. Like, well, it's TV. What are you going to do? It's TV, but I mean it, it's cheap enough that it's kind of hurt kind of hurts the movie. So if you weren't there at the it's time, slow, it might not have paced, the impact. It doesn't. Yeah, the, the 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 scares aren't as big as I think. People if you might, can put yourself in the context it. of when it was made, I think it will impress. Okay. You. He also did the Mangler, which sucked. Well, after uh, <laughs> you know, in the late eighties, you know, like yeah. he and a lot of his contemporaries, you know, mm-hmm. John Carpenter. Like I think Carpenter did work good work in the nineties, but nobody else does. I think he did some um, good work in the nineties, but it really got hit or miss. Yeah, like it got hit or miss. Like you said, the remake of Village of the Damned. Maybe one of his, his lesser. I, I think that's maybe his worst movie. I really don't like that. I think it's. I, I think the point <laughs> it's trying to make is really yeah, trite. I think, I think it kind of ruined it. I think thing. pro life is his worst movie. But, but that's a TV show. I'm not really going to say it's the same thing. Well, okay. Yeah. But yeah, uh, that this generation of like Masters of Heart, George Romero was another one mm-hmm. who yeah, like he made the Dark Half, but you know he's he's kind of then most of the '90s were kind of a callow a, period. A lot of these yeah. these direct you know. Uh, Joe Dante was having trouble finding work. Mm-hmm. Uh, John Landis was pretty persona non grata at that point. And mm-hmm. uh, I guess he's a horror filmmaker, yeah. As a, yeah. So yeah. he, he to- was always had one. Toby Hooper was out. just another one of those people who just constantly yeah. had trouble finding work. And he finally did find work in 1996 with The Mangler, another ostensible Stephen King uh, adaptation. Yeah, but it's 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 a stupid short story to begin with, and I'm not, I mean, I think Stephen King knows it. Mm-hmm. You read that short story. It's about the incredibly ludicrous series of events that would have to happen to create a killer possessed laundry machine. And <laughs> a, that's like the a, whole like gag. A, a laundry mangle. You know those things that you crank, that you push your clothes yeah, to? The that's whole, called a laundry mangle. The whole gag okay. is the protagonist of that short story lives in the real world and he knows how stupid that sounds, but he can know, <laughs> but there's so many things he discovers actually did happen to create a possessed laundry machine that he can't no he no longer deny it what Toby Hooper did and I think it was a huge mistake he, he, cre- said, he said it in an alternate dimension yeah he said it in an alternate yeah. dimension where a haunted laundry machine is actually the the, the most plausible thing about it <laughs> like everything about the movie is so tonally inconsistent and strange and absurd and you'd think it would be entertaining but it's really not it's I, a bad movie I, it's, it's a really bad movie I think it's bad I think it is entertaining though just nah, because work you know, D- Toby Hooper is just once again he gets to swing for the walls yeah. and after the mangler uh, he did a lot of TV um, he mm. did an episode of Perversions of Science mm. uh, which you know uh, which, which is which, one of the best what, episodes of what, Perversions what? of Science yeah. Panic if you missed our Perversions of Science episode, uh, that's the episode written by Andrew Kevin Walker, who wrote Seven, about Orson Welles' original 1938 War of the Worlds radio drama, which famously some people thought was real. Uh, and you're at a Halloween party, 
and people are hearing this uh, radio drama, thinking aliens have landed, and then Jason Lee mm. and uh, Jamie Kennedy whip out like implements of destruction and kill everyone at the party, like take off their human masks. <laughs> it and turns, turns out, out they're, they're, they're Martians who have been waiting for the invasion this whole time. And they think they missed the, the call to arms, and so now they're driving off to the landing site, and it's really clever and bizarre, mm-hmm. and I love that and of, and of course, it has a big twist ending. That's my favorite episode yeah. of Versions of Science, by far. I, I love that episode <laughs> so much. Um, so yeah, yeah, he did a lot of television, mm-hmm. and he did a few straight to video movies, which I haven't seen, so I can't really comment. Uh, on his those. last few, like what so, Jin, I didn't see. I saw his remake of the Toolbox Murders and didn't care for it. Yeah, um, um, I the one I saw as a kid that I really liked and I haven't revisited since like 1992 mm-hmm. uh, is Spontaneous Combustion. Which Wait, I, that's the one he made before Texas Chainsaw, isn't it? Or? No, he made no. Spontaneous Combustion was like early 90s. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. I remember liking it at the time. I have no idea if it holds yeah, up, so I can't really. Uh, I, I want to mention it because I, that's a soft spot in my heart. But I, have, it might not hold up. I have no idea. Uh, I was young, but yeah, he was. He was a strange man. I think in an alternate universe, just Toby Hooper never got off the ground. He was mm. such a strange guy. Yeah, and ha- had such weird ideas. Like he's like Don Coscarelli. Why is this guy allowed to make movies? You're very, we're very strange... lucky we ever had him at all. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we're, we're looking back over his career and kind of marveling over the fact that he had a chance just to begin with, and yeah. that he was able to leave his mark on not just horror but on cinema in general with yeah. one really groundbreaking film in the '70s, one really great horror film in the 1980s. I- Arguably the best and, horror movie of the 70s and easily at least one of the best horror movies of the 80s. Like, definitely. Yeah, and if he had only made those two movies, he would be a legend. And that floating around in these are all these really bonkers yeah. things that he just got to work on. Yeah. Because of these, like, sort of two tent poles that he just had big successes with. Just reveals that we had this really iconoclastic figure sneaking in through the cracks. And I always love mm. when we, we have one of those at, kind of actively at work. Yeah. Sadly, we no longer have Toby Hooper. He passed away at the age of 74 on Saturday night. Yeah. I, I learned about it right before I projected uh, They Live at the New Beverly Cinema. Oh. So it's kind of like a little bit of horror it's, synergy. Yeah. Well, um, in any case, Toby Hooper will, of course, be missed real, real fast. If you had to make a favorite, what's your favorite? Uh, well, I mean, i got to go with Texas Chainsaw. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an easy What's, yeah. a, what's your second favorite? Uh, and, you know, Poltergeist was really... What's your third uh, favorite? What's, uh, golly. Um... Life Force is my third favorite. Okay, I'm going to go with Texas Chainsaw 2. It's so great. Um, So if you've seen the other two, and you probably have, see Life Force, see Texas Chainsaw 2 if you haven't already. Um, And Toby Hooper will, of course, very, very much be missed. I think I'm going to put this out like live. This isn't going to be Patreon exclusive, Mm -hmm. just because it's for Toby Hooper. There's no reason they'll hide this. Hide this behind a wall. Well, people have asked us to, like, for people said they missed the when we had to do obituaries and career retrospectives Mm -hmm. of people who passed away. So this one, (laughs) if you like this, we have more exclusive videos available uh, through patreon.com slash canceled too soon. And we're going to do a couple more videos, at least one more video tonight, uh, Mm -hmm. that we'll release in the next 24 hours or so. So uh, thank you, everybody. For watching, uh, rest in peace, Toby Hooper.